And now, please welcome CEO and President of Booking Holdings, Glenn Fogel, in conversation with Skift Executive Editor and Founding Editor, Dennis Schall. Good evening, Amsterdam. Oh, no, wait. That's where you hang out when you're at Booking.com, right, Glenn? I'm in a lot of places. <laughs> thanks for being in New York. Thanks for being here tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. Hey, so we're almost the opening act. I mean, uh, you got any karaoke or anything like that? <laughs> I don't want to talk about some of the karaoke I've done. It's uh, too embarrassing, and hopefully nobody ever recorded it. I hope there's some YouTube on that, but yeah, we'll see. I don't think so. So we're supposed to be talking about uh, a long-term view on travel. And our research team uh, did a report that you're familiar with. Um, and one of the headlines was, Booking and Expedia, the easy money is over. What's next? I'm sure you never thought it was easy money in the past. It seemed like uh, there was a slugfest or two going on at the time. But thinking about the OTA land and, and booking holdings in particular, um, the report talked about how you know, you're under increased pressure, you know, revenue is slowing, room nights are slowing, profits are under pressure, there's increased competition. So is online travel and booking holdings still a good bet? Uh, boy, that's a very depressing story you just laid out there. <laughs> um, I try to make it complicated. You know, it, it never has been easy. That, let's just get that straight. And, and, you, and I did read the report, and um, I really appreciated it because I think you laid out how competitive this industry really is. And you made a lot of good points about there's a lot of good players in this industry. And uh, the only part where I was a little odd because you mentioned how much competition there was, but then you said there was a duopoly, which I found a little bit in conflict, but it's okay. Um, the fact is that we have a great industry, and uh, all of us here are in this industry, we're here because we really love it, because it's an industry that makes people happier. You know, I've been traveling now, I'm, I'm, I'm now in my 60s, I started traveling around the world when I was a, a college student in the summers, and I just have never, ever, ever gotten tired of going to new places and, and learning new things. So I think it's great. Now, you're really talking about, though, as a business, what's it like as a business, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And I am just so proud of our team, and we have done very well. It was never easy, but I've been at the company now, it's going to be 25 years I've been in this company in February. And I remember, I remember when our stock, and this is a reverse split thing, was $6 a share. $6. And I, I happened to glance today, and it's over 4000 It was that, lower than that, wasn't it? At one well, point? it was a reverse split. It was okay. a dollar, but we, we were so desperate, we had to actually do a reverse split and right. got it up to 6 or else we were going to get delisted. Um, so it's worked out okay. You know, it hasn't been bad. And I look at what we've achieved. I look at... You know, this is a company that uh, market cap is approaching $140 billion, which is fantastic. That's an enormous $140 billion value. Um, sometimes people are concerned because, they say, well, you know, that's so big. But the industry is huge. You know, round off. Let's call it $3 trillion. Let's make our math simple. $3 trillion uh, industry. And last year, 2023, we did round off again, $150 billion worth of travel. So easy math, three trillion, 150, so 5%. It's not, you know, this is a really small part of the whole industry, which to me says there's so much more that we can do. And I'm really looking forward to what we will do over the next several years. And I'll tell you, I've said this in several other uh, situations. I say that now is more exciting than it's ever been, and it's primarily because of the changes in technology that we are all experiencing. I just think it's going to be fantastic. But where is the growth going to come from? Is it going to be new geographies, uh, new verticals? Um, I can remember the days, say, a decade ago, where your room night growth was maybe... 24% or 28%, and next quarter you project um, your outlook is 3 to 5% room night growth. That's correct. Well, no, and there's definitely always going to be ups and downs, ins and outs, and uh, in that same report you put out, and it, you, you laid out what you think the long-term growth is. I just is. want to say, I want to give credit to our research department. It wasn't me. Pranavi wrote the report. Yeah, no, it's fine. And, and the thing that uh, she wrote, and you look at that growth rate, significantly more than GDP. 
So here's right. the thing about travel. Travel always, always. When you look at a long-term uh, trend line, Travel has increased more than GDP, which kind of makes sense. People get wealthier and such. You want to travel more and such. And then you add on a couple of things. But for our, what, what she laid out is that we're going to grow a lot faster than GDP, which as a, a growing company, that's great. Now, at this size, you're not going to grow 25% a year. That ain't going to happen. Um, but I am, I'm, I'm pleased with where we are. And I'm really pleased with the things that we're building and such. And we talk about things like our AI trip planner, which is still very, very early. But you see the early stages of some real transformative things happening where it's going to be so much easier. You know, and I, I say this all the time. It's a great business. We love it. We love, the, we love being in it. We love traveling. But we all, or almost all, recognize it's nowhere near where it should be. That putting together your trips, especially if it's a complicated trip, let's say it's a family trip, a couple of kids, and you're going to go to a couple of cities, and you got a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of decisions that you have to make. And it's hard, and it's frustrating. And a lot of times you just want uh, and you put away the phone, or you put away the, the desktop, because you just want to do something else for a while. We need to make it. So it's easy, as easy as for so many other things, so many other industries that do it so well. And that's what I believe that Gen AI is going to do, and I believe we're going to be one of the people who's going to be able to accomplish this, and I think we'll do it faster than many others, because of the advantages. We have the capital. We have the, you know, the incredible skilled people. Uh, we've been at it for a very long time. Now, again, not going to be easy. Nothing ever is, but I am looking forward to this. What about the emergence of uh, new entrants like, uh, like banks, like Chase Travel? I think they project... Uh, 15 billion in sales next year. Yeah. Uh, does that concern you that uh, they're going to take a lot of market share? I, again, um, I recognize there's always going to be competition, lots of competition. That's good. It's good for the industry. It's good for us. Keeps us on our toes. Got to keep making better services. I just wish regulators would recognize what you just said. We're going to talk about that. Well, I, someday I think I'll have to get you to testify sometime about how competitive this world really is. That'll be a separate issue. Um, but look. You got banks, you got new entrants, you got people who want to put venture capital to work, especially in the new areas using AI stuff. Lots of new things coming in. Nobody's going to just get an easy way to the, the, the top. I, I think that we have a good chance. So one of the ways you want to grow is through flights. And last year, um, you were trying to acquire eTraveli, and um, they turned it down. We have a video of uh, what you said last year about that, that deal. Now, I, don't, I, I can't get into the minds of the people, the regulators, in terms of what their thinking is. I can say a couple things that I know to be true. And these are, first of all, we are not a dominant player in travel in Europe. The numbers that I saw some of the regulators put out I don't know where they come from, but they are not right. I also know the fact that us doing a flight business certainly you know, would help our hotel businesses, no doubt about that. They, and the regulator said one to 3%. That was their decision. Yeah, so that one to 3% is what regulators said uh, your hotel business would, would benefit uh, by this deal. But, um, now, to bring this up, to, well, that, that deal is tied up in the courts, right? You're appealing it. We are appealing, correct. Right. So now, uh, in the latest developments, uh, uh, the EU declared Booking.com uh, a gatekeeper. Um, and one of the things that means um, is that hotels are going to be able to, to uh, have, display lower prices on their own websites than on Booking.com. So what is your take on that? How is that going to, uh, will that upend your business at all? Or, or how do you view that? All right, so what Dennis is talking about is the concept of parity. And when we first started out our booking.com company, it was an agency only model. So the prices are set by the hoteliers. They're not set by us. It's an agency business. And we said, here's the deal. Here's what we'd like to propose to you. Uh, hotel manager. We will take all the information you give us and we'll put it onto our site. 
and we will translate it into 40 different, 40 something different languages. And we'll take your photos and we'll put that up and we'll help advise on how they should be done to be able to sell it. We'll do content. And we'll do all the customer service for you, free, in all these different languages. And in addition, we'll do a tremendous amount of marketing that you won't have to do, so you don't have to pay for it. We'll get customers to you. The only thing we'd like you to do, please, is that if we get a customer for you, and they stay in your hotel, and you get paid, we'd like you to send us a commission. Seems a very good deal. Now, of course, though, what wouldn't work, since you set the price, what wouldn't work for us is that if you put one price with us, and then you put a lower price on your hotel, well, what's going to happen is people will use us, they'll just look for the right hotel, and then maybe they'll click over to you, and that was back in the old day, this parody thing. And then, for whatever reason, some people say, well, we don't like this idea, government regulators, and, they, and now parody is gone. But it started going away before this. Certain countries had already gotten rid of it, and we, in those countries, it didn't exist anymore. In addition, we are no longer just an agency player. Booking.com now can do payments, so we too can give lower prices. So it's no longer the way it was in the olden days when we just took a price and that was it, nothing to be done. Now, it's a much more competitive situation, but it's worked out in the countries where we didn't have parity, we did fine, we're still growing nicely and all that. So it turns out, look, it's not, I, I think the parity thing worked great. I think it was good for everybody. Regulators come in, new rules. We follow the new rules, okay. The interesting thing to me though is when you look at the countries where parity went away, we're still doing fine. I believe now, one of the things you'll end up in the same way you always end up with, like you can go to Blockbuster and, and buy something. Blockbuster prices how they want to price it. Right. Or you can go online to the supplier and buy it that way. It's okay. I'm fine with it. I don't think it's as, as big a deal as some people made it out to be. Okay. So I was going to ask you, um, does this complicate your strategy for the connected trip? So if hotels are, you know, are offering lower rates on their own websites, then why would somebody want to build, you know, book their whole trip on Booking.com? Well, again, we can we can price it. Well, first of all, it's just price. Look, we can uh, again because now you can do we can price any way we want now because it's no longer just an agency play as it was. That's right. one. So if a hotel wants to drop price, we can drop price too. But let's do another thing. The whole idea is why you want to, somebody to put your where you want to do your booking is going to be more than just price. And that's, my concept is value. Value is not just price. Yes, you have to have a good price, but you have to have great service. You have to have ease of use. You have to have all the things that decide why you decide to use this service versus that service, and it's more than just price. The connected trip is one of the things I believe that is a very important way that someone can provide a better service to a consumer, and it works both ways because the consumer for us is not just the traveler, it's also the partner, and we can provide ways to enable a partner to be able to get more business and participate in the connected trip. For example, let's say we have someone who wants to travel to, oh, let's say it's, oh, Naples, and there's a ferry uh, company that gives people a ride to go to Capri, right? Well, knowing that we have that, the ferry person in our attractions area can give us discounted prices that we could put in in an opaque way so it's not, it's not going to be disclosing its prices all along and get that in there. It's giving that operator a chance to put their attraction within our Connect trip, give more customers to them. Lots more things that we can do. And then you go back into all the AI stuff and being able to do this in a creative way to come up with ways that we can maximize optimize the trips to provide the greatest value to both sides of the marketplace. Got it. Um, your CFO uh, appeared at an investor conference, uh, I think it was last week, and he said um, booking.com or booking holdings is underappreciated in several areas. And one area, he said, was in short-term rentals. Now, most people don't realize, uh, he said, that you are now doing two-thirds the number of room, room nights as Airbnb. I don't think people understand uh, that you're large and that big in uh, short-term rentals. 
So, and also that you've been growing faster than Airbnb in 12 of the last 13 quarters in terms of uh, room night growth. So, is there any chance in the world that you're going to catch Airbnb? Um, well, so a couple of things to, to take, take that apart here. So, I am very proud of our homes uh, team. They really have done some wonderful things. And the fact that we have now grown that to be two thirds the size of Airbnb, and the fact to be able to have grown faster than Airbnb in our, our homes group against their business in 12 less 13 quarters is just, just a testament to the great work that is being done by a lot of people. Really happy about that. Now, we can try and you know, put out some numbers, try, well, if we keep growing at this rate and they keep growing at that rate, what time do we take? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I do know that we absolutely believe that the homes area is a very important part of the business. It's something that people like, people want, and we believe we have some advantages because when people come to visit our sites, they see not only homes or hotels, they see both. Is that, that gives, really an advantage? Oh, I think it's a huge advantage, and here's why. Because a lot of people come to our site and they're not sure what they want or they think they know what they want, but after they've looked at everything, they choose something else. And I have data that can prove that. We have data that shows people coming and they have done a search. And if they've done a search and they didn't start off with something that would trigger what you thought they wanted, uh, they just given anything. We see how they go back and forth, back and forth. Or even when they start, let's say they go to Google and they said, Hotels New York. So now they've landed on our site, they clicked on that, and you would think, okay, they're gonna buy a hotel. But I have the data that shows actually a bunch of them are not gonna buy a hotel, they're gonna buy an uh, apartment. And it's fascinating that, and that is an advantage, because it is, it's a lot easier to compare and contrast all the different accommodation choices in one page, seeing the reviews, seeing what the benefits of each one, what the prices are, what the reviews are. And that, I believe, is an easier way than going back and forth through a whole bunch of sites. That's an advantage. I like it. <laughs> um, another area that um, your CFO said your company is misunderstood or underappreciated is that uh, it's out of date. Your dependence on Google uh, is not as great as it used to be for marketing. Um, and that one of the areas I've heard you talk about uh, that you're excited about is uh, social media marketing. Can we show the TikTok video? It's not a big deal, but Booking.com actually called me a genius. Yeah, I think that's just the name of their loyalty program. No, you don't believe me. Look, the Dominic. Genius. Got a room upgrade. Genius. Booked a graffiti class. Genius. Booked a bagel making class. Genius. Got free breakfast. Genius. 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 Want a chance to win Brooklyn's trip? Check the caption. Genius. What is it about TikTok and social media marketing these days that make it uh, more ready for prime time than it was in the past? Um, I don't think that the media has changed at all. I think what has happened is the explosion of the number of people watching it okay. is, 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 is a little bit of the difference. Right. Um, so going back to where Dennis started with about, um, and, and this issue about Google, et cetera, one of the things that people may have thought in the past that we get a tremendous number of our customers from only from Google. Now, we get customers from Google, absolutely. But one of the things that has been really fun to be talking about, we talk in our earnings calls with our investors and in talking about how we have a mid 50 percentage of, the, of our people coming back, they come back direct, and then even more to, to be able to compare that, if we take out our B2B section, it's the low 60% who are coming to us directly. That to us is showing something about loyalty, showing something about people like it, people want to come just directly to us, it's not just renting customers at Google. Now, we also want to be able to expand, though, and do, do other ways. So certainly uh, many of you here in the U.S. remember some of the way back ads we do for our Priceline company with William Shatner back in the day, and then we've done others, and et cetera, going all the way through a lot of TV stuff. We've done Super Bowl ads, Melissa McCarthy, Tina Fey. Well, that's all linear TV stuff. 
Also, you have to go out where the people are. And there are certainly, uh, uh, particularly younger people, you tell them, you know, TV, they're like, what's that? Because they're watching, you know, not TV, they're right. streaming, all that. So we got to go, we got to put the advertising, the brand advertising in front of people where they're watching. And we'll see, we'll see how it works. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to mention Expedia. So um, Expedia just went through a uh, three or four year tech migration. Um, <clears throat> and while that was going on, um, they stopped marketing Verbo. Uh, they rolled out a loyalty program. Uh, the Hotels.com loyalty program got diluted. <clears throat> so Verbo and Hotels.com in particular still haven't caught back up. Were you watching that and sitting back in your backyard with your feet up going, aha, you know, they, they, they slowed themselves down. They shot themselves in the foot. Do you, did you watch that? Did you take any lessons from that? So what, what I think is always really important is you want to always keep an eye on your competition. You know, one eye, look and see what they're doing, all that, and especially if you can learn something that may be helpful to you. But we've always thought the most important thing is looking at ourselves and how can we do things that are better for our customers. And that's the focus always, not what's happening with somebody else, but what can we do to do things better? That's the way we, we, we really try and improve by saying, what are we missing for ourselves, not what somebody else may or may not be doing. So, you know, to answer your question, I, I've always respected all the competitors in our space. They're all very, very good. And like you say, going back to the beginning, nothing's easy, but if you want to succeed, make sure you're looking at your own products and services most of the time, not looking at somebody else's situation. Why don't we hear about you guys doing these uh, platform migrations? Um, we are always improving the company all the time, but I'm not sure going out and telling people, well, here's the technical changes we're making here. Well, who cares, right? Nobody cares. Yeah. What they care is, is the service better or not? Right. That's what a traveler cares about. They care not at all if I come out with something about, well, we're changing from this database here to the old Hadoop into a new BDX that will go through the, who cares? I mean, that's fascinating. Right, no, what they care is, are you gonna make it easier for to do my trip or not? And is it gonna be the right price? And if something goes wrong, is somebody gonna pick up the phone quick enough and fix it for me? That's what people care about. Right. So um, have you heard about founders mode and uh, everything that's going on in social media about founders mode? Does that ring missed, a bell? I, mi I missed that memo. Uh, okay, so Brian Chesky gave a private talk <clears throat> Apparently not so private that you know about it. it yeah, it's, it's big on social media. He'll talk about it, I'm sure. And Private public. And in, um, and in theory, uh, what he was talking about is, you know how it's the common um, perception that a founder has a few good years and then eventually he has to give way to a manager, okay? And um, he's saying that that's a mistake, that oftentimes founders need to hang on be more hands-on, and it's a, it's a mis it was a mistake for him for a while. He gave up some, uh, some functions to some, some managers, and he said, you know, things went awry. Have, um, Jay Walker founded your company, he Priceline. Did. Yes. You didn't found the company. Would, would the company be better off if Jay was still around? He Jay left. was never the CEO. Okay. He, he founded the company. He was never the man. He was never his inspiration. Okay. And that was, I don't know, let's say 97, another century. And I think he, he left the company entirely into any role, the, but for a shareholder, but I don't know, a year or two later, three years? Right. I don't know. It's so far back, I don't even remember it. Right. But your question is, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, should founders, um, after a few years, should they expect to give up the role as CEO and hand it over to somebody who's better in management? I have no idea. Okay. No, I know. I, I've never been a founder, I don't know. I know this, whether it's a founder or a professional manager, whatever the hell that means, one hopes all the managers are getting paid and therefore they're professionals, not amateurs. But at the end of the day, what matters is what are you doing? Are you making good services for people? Are you doing the right thing? And I don't, oh, does it matter whether the person's the founder or not? I don't know. I mean, we have some great examples of people who've done wonderful things who are founders for a really long time. Right. 
I mean, how long was Bezos running, running the show there? 20 something years, right? right? Yep. Um, Musk still running all of his things, right? Great example. Henry Ford, I yeah, think. Yeah, Twitter, I think that that's a great done. example. Hmm. That may be the one where, is he come in as a professional manager after the founder? I don't know how to that. I don't know what he that. is. I don't know. Um, I was thinking about the, the car, too, by the way. Oh, yeah, the car's pretty good. The car's good. Yeah, we got it. And the rocket works. The, the whole space thing's pretty good. Yeah, it works, good. yeah. Starlink, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's good. Politics, eh. Okay, um, so. I have no comment about what he said. I just want to make sure I'm neutral here on that. I just want to get that across. So in uh, July 1st, uh, California implemented a new, uh, what people are calling a junk fee law, where you have to disclose the total price um, <clears throat> except for taxes up front. And uh, both Expedia and Airbnb said they're facing headwinds because of the change. Are you guys, and how are you doing there in, in California because of the I, change? I, I haven't looked at California numbers uh, at all. I, 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 here's, here's the important thing on that question, okay? I have been pushing this for so many years. When I first became CEO and I was in Washington, every single person I talked to in Washington, I'd be talking about, we need, we need a regulation about this because nobody on their own is gonna do it. Because if anybody on their own took the resort fee and added that at the beginning and showed as the headline price, they would immediately be price disadvantaged so n even though I'd speak with a lot of the CEOs of a lot of the hoteliers, they say, yeah, I'd like to do it, but I can't because if I do it, my hotel is not competitive. We need everybody to do it at once, but we can't all get together and, and agree to it because then we'd be violating antitrust laws and we'd all go to jail and that'd be really bad. And I would say that, they'd say, yeah, so I'm glad that something like that's happening. Now the bad thing on this though is that we don't want this state by state by state, and every state has a different kind of rule about this. This needs to be federal, and it just so happens there happens to be a law right now that's in Washington that's being worked on. The Senate has one little version, the House has another little version of it, and they need to get it together and get it out. But absolutely, who the heck ever enjoyed the experience? You thought your hotel was going to be this, and then you get there, and they mumble something about, oh, and there'll be a $58 oil resort fee on top of that. Nobody enjoyed that. That was horrible. And it was a mandatory. So, well, I won't use the resort part. No, you got to use it. And that was horrible. So we all want it to be fair, transparent. It's common sense. Nobody liked that thing. And now, finally, OK, California's got their own law. They got out in front. I'm really looking forward to the federal one rule for everybody across the country. Got it. I have time for one more quick question. So your uh, short-term rentals, they're, they're, you talked about the growth. Why is it lagging so much in the, in the US? Oh, I don't think it's lagging per se. I think we're growing very nicely. It's still very small in the US. Why is it so compared, small? Compared, well, we started out late. There, there's this other company that's really big in, in, in the US. I heard of them. Yeah, yep. right. And so, you know, it'll take time and improve the product and all that. Look, if you go anywhere in Europe and you walk down the street and you say to somebody, look, I need, I need uh, an apartment in this, this city or I need, I'd like, is there a place on the beach that's a home that I'd like that? Absolutely, they would say, well, go to, Bear, go, go, go to Airbnb or Booking.com, and I'll bet you Booking.com will come up first a lot of the times, okay? You do that in New York City, yeah, Booking.com's probably not gonna come up that uh, nearly as often, right? That's something that for us to do, to improve the awareness, improve our, our, our numbers, et cetera. But the great thing to me, the way I look at that, I don't see that as a negative. I see that as a positive. That's all upside for us. We're, we're growing faster. 12 of the last 13 quarters, we're two thirds the size. We increased the number of listings last uh, quarter by 11%. We got 7.8 million listings around the world and we are still tiny in the US. That is an incredible opportunity for this company. Glenn, let's talk about it next year. See how you're doing. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.